My name's Trevin. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to just say happy Memorial Day weekend to you all. And hello to those of you who are watching online. Um, so if you are new here, first off, I want to meet you because I like to meet new people. Um, but also, if you're new here, this junk joke won't make too much sense to you. But I, I talk a lot about my kids. Every sermon ends up having a story about my kids. And I was trying to find some other stories to switch things up a bit and realize I really don't have anything else that I do. <laughs> if I'm not, you know, here working on stuff, it's thinking about my kids. In the morning, I think about how 6.30 came way too fast. Oh, these are my kids. Yeah, super cute. Um, Cal's three and a half. Beckham just turned two. He wanted to be like older bro and get an astronaut suit. And quick little tip for parents. Uh, in the background, you see it looks like a spaceship on my TV. YouTube has 10 hours of flying through, you know, AI-generated space. Pretty sweet. So you can just put the kids in their space suits and leave them there for 10 hours. It works great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, waking up at 6.30, I think about it, that's just a bit too early. And then I think about how being woken up with a hand over the mouth with the whispered, I'm hungry, in your ear is actually terrifying, and as it is adorable. In the afternoon, I think about how great it's going to be to finish up work so I can go home and hear those four pattering feet run to the door to greet me there. And then as I come in the door, I think about how long is it going to take to clean up all the spilled mac and cheese off the floor. It's actually easier if you let it dry, if you didn't know that. It comes up way easier. Don't give me that. <laughs> in the evening, I think about how much water splash out of the tub does it take to create irreversible damage. Every night, I'm like, okay, is this the night where the tub falls through the ceiling? I, I don't know. And then I think about how incredible it is, how my kids love each other during bedtime stories snuggled up with one another. And then once bedtime's over, which, hap which is anywhere between 30 minutes and three hours long, um, I, you know, kick up my feet, maybe lay in bed, scroll through the social media apps, catch up on what's happening in the world, scroll past scary or depressing story after another. And then I start to think, Lord, what are you doing with my kid's future? I start to worry about our school system, our political system, our justice system, the, the economic future of our country, and I start to worry, what are my kids gonna grow up in? Maybe you can relate to that. One of these fairly normal evenings as I'm scrolling through, and it's called doom scrolling because you just keep scrolling, hoping to find some happy story of like a monkey riding on a dog or something. And no, it's just one depressing story after another until I came across one post and I tried to find it. Uh, I couldn't find it. But, but I'm confident that it was God speaking to me in that moment as I'm thinking, God, what are you doing with my kid's future? In the post, I don't remember exactly what it said, but what I internalized and what God spoke to me in that moment was stop worrying so much about your kids. I made them for a time like this. Stop worrying so much about your grandkids. I made them for a time like this. God is sovereign. And even then, when the world is showing its brokenness in full form, even when the path seems so much harder, God is sovereign. And sometimes, as we'll see today with the Israelites, the path God takes us on seems the harder, the more dangerous, the less logical path, but it's his plan, and his plan never fails. So with that, let me open in prayer as we dig into Exodus 13 this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are sovereign. Lord, thank you already for the testimony of your movement around the world this morning. Seeing the Buries go to Germany, seeing Tihol in his work in South Sudan, knowing all the testimonies that are shared at Sunday school this morning as people celebrate things and pray for one another. Thank you that we are a church that believes in your gospel. And when we close today, Lord, you are sending us out into our communities to share that good news. Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak to each of us as we open your word, 
that you would illuminate Scripture for us through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, that you would convict us to a deeper relationship with you, and that we would trust in you. Amen. So you can open up or turn on or look up there. We're going to read Exodus 13, 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. All right, so a lot happening here, and we've got a random dead guy in the middle of that. We're going to unpack this. But we're going to start with verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. NIV says, although that was shorter. God led them on the longer and probably harder path. Um, if any of you came to church last month, you knew that we... Uh, they were redoing the, the road out here, which made it a little difficult at times, a little sketchy. Uh, but now we've got this great paved road. They did not have great paved roads back then. The roads that were the most comfortable to travel on were the roads that were traveled the most on because the earth was compact, compacted by people. And so as God's leading them on the longer road, the probably less traveled road, it was also going to be the harder road. Maybe already you're like, yep, been there, currently on the harder road right now. I can totally relate to the Israelites. Maybe if you're like me, you grabbed on to that word Philistines. Because that, those bedtime stories we read for the last like year has been David and Goliath every night. Which is a great story, don't get me wrong, but every night it gets a little bit repetitive. And actually so much so that one night Cal or three-year-old was like, Daddy, I want to read it. And I'm like, okay, cool. I mean, he, I think he knows like half the alphabet by now, but he opens it up and starts reading it verbatim because we've read it so much, he has, has it memorized. And I'm like, dude, I got to record this. This is awesome. So free story. Yeah, that was random. Um, but David and Goliath, I'm like, okay, the Philistines, those are the bad guys. Why doesn't God just like take them by the way of the Philistines and just destroy them then? That makes sense, right? Well, the, the Philistines were fearsome fighters, but, but they weren't Israel's enemies yet. And the mission the Israelites are on right now, as they leave Egypt, is very focused. One, go to the promised land. Take Canaan. And two, as God told Abraham in Genesis 15, 16, in so taking Canaan, you are also going to bring judgment on the sins of the Amorites. The Philistines will come later. The mission right now is to go take Canaan and bring God's judgment. Plus, the longer path actually served more purpose than just getting them from point A to point B. The second part of 17 says, For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. God leads them down the longer path because he knows them better than they know themselves. He knows, or the Israelites... They're really, right now, just Israelites by name. Much of their mind, their practices, their preferences, even their culture is very much Egyptian. They spent 400 years in the same place. You better believe that Egypt run, ran, um, rubbed off on them, right? The Israelites may have just left Egypt, but Egypt had not, le not yet left the Israelites. Maybe you're thinking, well, why would they return to slavery? Surely fighting a battle would be a little bit better than going back to slavery. Well, first off, even when they were slaves, they were protected. Egypt had an incredible army at this time, and they knew what to expect. They knew, I mean, they'd survived for 400 years. Sure, it might have been hard, but they're like, as soon as war comes, they're going to flee back to what they know. But also, they had just pillaged the Egyptians. 
Remember, God had those 10 plagues roll through, and by the end of it, the Egyptians were like, get out of here and take all of our gold with you because we want you gone. The Israelites might have been thinking, hey, maybe we can go back and broker a deal, bring back some of their stuff, and say, hey, don't mess with us again because our God's going to put his plagues on you. They might have actually been thinking that, God, maybe you got it wrong. Maybe Egypt really was the promised land. And now we finally have a means of making it our own. Whatever they were thinking, God knew that if war came, they would try to go back there. So the longer, harder path is protecting the Israelites from the Philistines and is protecting it from themselves. Can can you relate to any of this? Do you feel like you're on the longer, harder path sometimes? I see a big head nod from one of the hornicles up there. Do you feel like you can't catch a break sometimes? Do you feel like this Christian life isn't quite as easy as you thought it was going to be? Maybe you feel like God isn't actually really there for you. Or maybe you feel like God doesn't really know what he's doing in providing for your kids. Or your grandkids. Or you. But God, God does know. We can rationally know that, logically know that. And let's see how he leads the Israelites. Verse 18. But God led the people around by way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. So we're reading out of the ESV. The ESV says equipped for battle. The NIV says ready for battle. So they, they may have been equipped, had some swords of some sort. They may have mentally felt a little bit ready, but the, the NASB gets a little bit closer to, I think, what was really happening. Verse 18 is translated like this in the NASB. Therefore God led the people around by way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in battle formation from the land of Egypt. This is, imp- this is just an important little nuance because w- sometimes the English language is going to make us think of something different. When we hear, hear, read this and that they were equipped for battle, we might think that they were in armor and had swords and they had spears and some chariots. No, they, they, God does uh, equip them and does arm them a little bit later, but right now they may have had a couple dozen swords for the couple hundred thousand of them that were there. They're certainly not ready for battle. They are slaves. They are not trained for battle. But me- maybe mentally they were ready for battle. They just had... God do incredible things. And they're thinking, nothing can stop us now because God's going to provide for us. But what was really happening is they, they were actually marching out of Egypt in a battle formation, in probably some, but in medium-sized groups, like a battalion. And this is actually, I think, God's, uh, one of God's ways that he's protecting them because this was before binoculars were invented. And so f- from a far way off, people might just look, oh, there's a massive army uh, uh, leaving Egypt right now. We're going to turn the other way. It looks like an army. They might kind of sound like an army with their marching. I have to imagine that um, the, any marauding, um, marauding thieves would have looked at this and said, oh, we need to turn and run the other way. Or any Philistine military outposts or Amorite mili- military outposts would have sent word back, hey, there's a big army leading And they would have said, uh, do not engage, turn and run the other way. From afar, they might have looked like a formidable army, but but they weren't. And if you got a little bit closer, you'd see old men, women, children, and you'd know that they were not ready for battle. Can you relate to any of this? Do you sometimes feel inadequate for the things of the world? Do you sometimes feel ready and equipped and yet you find yourself falling short? Do you sometimes feel like you're heading into battle, but don't know how it's going to end or where the battle is going to take place? Well, let's keep reading. I think we can continue to relate to the Israelites and see how God provides for them. Verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Okay, so why is this random piece of information of carrying up a dead guy with them in here? Well, 
If you remember Joseph, Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat, right? Joseph is the very reason why they are in Egypt. And Joseph, on his deathbed, looked at the people around him and said, I know that this is not our final resting place as a people. I don't want it to be my final resting place. You got to take my remains with you. He longed for the promised land just as much as his fathers before him and the fathers to come. It's also, this is also an important physical reminder to the people of Israel not to forget their past, not to forget where they came from. You see, Joseph was likely embalmed uh, in a similar Egyptian fashion, so bringing his remains was not a small feat. He was not conveniently placed in a little urn that they could just throw onto a wagon. No, he, it was probably a fairly large thing, maybe even a little bit heavy. Walking out of Egypt with a physical reminder of who brought them there, God, drives home the point of who is bringing them out of there. It's God. Now we see these two cities here, and we don't know the precise location of where they are because it was a long time ago and the land shifted and changed and had a couple wars and whatnot over that area. But we know the general region, and it's likely south-southeast direction from where they were leaving Egypt. Now remember, picture this. The Israelites, men, women, children, young and old, they're walking away from everything they knew with tons of gold and a dead guy's remains in a military formation despite having no military experience or really any weapons. They're standing on the edge of the wilderness, on the edge of the unknown, on the edge of a desolate desert, on the edge of enemy territory all around them, right on the edge of the harder road. Can, can you relate to this? Do you ever stand on the edge of the unknown? How do you feel when you're there? Do you ever lose sight of who you truly are? What, what does that feel like? Do you ever find yourself in a spot that you know God led you, but you just have no idea how he's going to lead you out of there? Let's keep reading and see how God provides for them. Verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. What? Pillar of fire and a cloud? I have never seen a pillar of fire, personally, although I've seen the Prince of Egypt. Has anyone watched that? A couple head nods. I, I'm, we're going to see a little clip of actually an AI-generated video. P people have been You've probably heard about AI images and videos and whatnot. People are plugging in scripture and coming up with some really neat renditions of what things might have looked like. We're going to watch that in a sec, but the reason I'm not showing the Prince of Egypt one is because it's important to note when God did this. In the Prince of Egypt, he sends the pillar of fire down once they get to the Red Sea, when the Egyptian army is there. But God's sending it even before that. He's sending them to lead them even to the Red Sea. So let's look at this little video of what a pillar of fire might have looked like. It's kind of scary. Kind of intense, incredible. This is another someone, an artist rendition. Who know? We don't know what it actually looked like, but a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. I'm sure you might have heard that this cloud and fire, um, they were a great form of ancient GPS, and even much easier to follow actually, because as easy as GPS is sometimes, I'm still missing streets and whatnot. Now, walking through the desert by day, the cloud might have even provided then some shade from the hot sun. And so this is a practical provision from the Lord. The pillar of fire at night was going to add some warmth and some light. And imagine, for hundreds of thousands of people walking through the desert, it provided light for all of them. It was probably a massive pillar of fire. 
This was also God's glorious stamp of favor and protection on them. It says, and the Lord went before them. This was God actually manifest there, pre present with them. This was not just him sending something down for them to follow. God was sending his presence down with them. And you have to believe that those marauding bands of thieves probably ran the other direction when they see a huge cloud or a huge pillar of fire. And similarly, if anyone got a little bit close enough to the Israelites and saw that they are actually pretty beaten up and would have been really easy to take over, certainly they're running the other direction when they see a big pillar of fire leading them. The pillar cloud was a manifestation of Yahweh himself, not merely something he sent them. Friends, we can find peace and comfort and, and even motivation in this too. When you feel like you're on the longer, harder path, when you feel like you, you just can't catch a break, or you, you feel like God doesn't really know what he's doing to provide for your kids or grandkids, or you sometimes just feel inadequate for the things of the world, or you, you stand on the edge of the unknown when you, when you lose sight of who you truly are, or when you even find yourself in a spot that you have no idea why God took you there and how you're going to get out. When the brokenness, the death, the illness, when the debt and hardship, when the suffering and persecution and confusion and the unknown starts to overcome and starts to give you that feeling of doom, God is sovereign. God is so sovereign over all of it. He is in control. And like the pillar cloud was a manifestation of Yahweh himself, Jesus was God himself on earth. God sent Jesus, his only son, to earth. He came to earth with an even greater power and authority than a pillar of fire. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I would actually prefer to be led by a pillar of fire it's just way easier to see, right? Sometimes it, it feels a little difficult to walk through this life and go, Lord, which direction? Can you just like drop a little cloud or something? Maybe some big arrows turn here. It seems like it would have been much clearer, right? Or even being alive when Jesus was alive. Being able to see God in flesh, to touch him, to, to listen to him, to actually sit next to him. It wouldn't get much clearer than that, right? But even Jesus said in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And in verse 13, he says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Friends, we actually have it so good. If you have put your faith in Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as the only way to heaven, the Holy Spirit resides in you. The Holy Spirit is our very own GPS, our very own helper, our very own comforter, our very own protector and convictor, our very own motivator. The Holy Spirit is our very own stamp of God's approval as God looks at us with righteousness, with the righteousness of Christ because of the seal of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our future life in eternity with God. How incredible is that? Sometimes it feels difficult, and it is. We're on this side of heaven. We're on this side of eternity with God. So what do we do with this information? What do we do with this ancient story of God's provision, protection, and promise for the Israelites. I'm going to boil it down really simply. Two words. Trust God. Trust that God in his sovereignty made you for a time like this. Trust that God in his sovereignty made you for a time like this. He made your children for a time like this. He made your grandchildren for a time like this. Trust in Jesus and the work that he did on the cross to give us salvation. Trust in the Holy Spirit within you 
that will guide you. Trust God. Let's pray for that. Let's pray that we would lean in to trusting God more. Heavenly Father, we come before you, uh, many of us actually, with hardships, with brokenness in our lives, with a sense of doom and confusion. Lord, I pray that even in the midst of our darkest moments, in the midst of our valleys, God, that we would find strength and peace in trusting you. Lord, I pray even on the mountaintops as things are going great and we think that we have got it all figured out, God, you are still sovereign and want to lead us and use us. I pray that you would give us the strength to trust you there too. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you that we have an incredible body of believers that does have faith in you, that does trust you. And I pray that we would spur each other on to sharing the truth of your son with the world around us and trusting in you more as we go through the things of this world. God, thank you for making us, thank you for making us for a time like this. Amen.